Uh, hello, everyone. I guess we are about ready to get started. Um, so yeah, so this is a two-hour um, block, but I'll be dividing it up into like I'll have a, two intermissions for for Q and A. So uh, be sure to have uh, questions in your mind and ready, and don't be afraid to ask a question. If you have a question, something's on your mind. It's likely that at least five other people uh, that occurred to them too. So don't be afraid to uh, ask questions. Uh, it's very important to make sure that everybody. Uh, Everybody understands everything that's going on. That I haven't overlooked anything, or you know, I'm not making some crucial mistake. Because obviously, this is in the imperfect tense, securing the Tor network. I'm not saying, oh, I everything is solved forever for sure. This is it. You know, it's an ongoing process. Okay, so who who the hell am I? Um, I'm a volunteer Tor developer. I work on Tor because I think it's important uh, for a few reasons that I'll get into later. Um, professionally, I'm a forward and reverse engineer. I uh, write, write uh, C++ code and reverse engineer uh, the uh, Microsoft Exchange Protocol along with a few others for uh, river, Riverbed Technology. This is a company, uh, shameless plug time just to uh, berate you people about my employer. Uh, we make WAN accelerators. Essentially we make WAN traffic fast for co companies, large companies with lots of branch offices all over the place. Uh, significant accelerations for Windows file sharing that's done across a you know distributed intranet. Uh, uh, also significant uh, 5 to 50 X uh, exchange uh, uh, enhancements of import, uh, improvement of performance for uh, Microsoft Exchange, uh, that's the protocol that I work on. Uh, we also do protocol independent data reduction, so if you send some data over uh, Exchange, you, the next time you fetch it via the Windows file share, it's also uh, cached and accelerated. Um, and we are pretty good at, at, at it. Uh, when we go head to head against any of our competitors, 90% win rate. Uh, we are outselling Cisco two to one, and they're pretty anti-competitive about their practices. They give away, give significant deals on a lot of their WAN acceleration equipment for people who have Cisco gear, uh, and we're still uh, significantly outselling them. So we're pretty successful. But that's the end of that plug. If you're interested in 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 that company and work at, uh, in reverse engineering, fuzzing network protocols, uh, you know, C++ development, network programming. Um, Pretty much uh, all, uh, on Linux, of course. Um, come talk to me afterwards or whatever, and we can we can discuss uh, you know setting up with an interview or whatever. Uh, so preaching in the choir about um, why I think Tor is important for normal people. Um, there's all, you know a lot of talks a uh, talk about you know it it should be it's a censorship resistance tool. It's for political dissidents, people who are under oppressive firewalls. But I think there's a compelling argument for normal people for basic data hygiene uh, to keep their IP address out of essentially marketing databases. Um, we don't really yet understand the consequences of having all of our uh, you know essentially thoughts that we enter into Google whenever we come up with some idea archived and tied to our IP address which is essentially our identity. Um, and then, maybe not in the case of Google, Google uh, has, uh, you know, they do do significant work to try and make sure that they protect uh, the data that they do massively acquire on all of us. Uh, but in other, in other companies, bought and sold to whoever. Um, so the, the 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 second point, you know, yeah, like I said, Google might not be that horribly evil, but I read my ISP's privacy policy. In fact, they tell me that they do gather my data in aggregate for marketing purposes. It's not a tr they specifically say it's not uniquely attributed to me, but they do mention that uh, they they gather gather aggregate data on on the internet usage uh, for marketing and other performance purposes. So. Uh, the, you know, this sort of infrastructure is already, uh, people are already thinking about this, uh, ways to use our data to either sell us products or see what sort of things we're interested in, and some things we might want to be able to opt out on. And if all of this is tied to our IP address, we don't really have a choice without Tor. Uh, and this sort of information can come back to get us in unexpected ways. Uh, if you're involved in a lawsuit, discovery uh, can cause this, this information to turn up. If it's subpoenaed and a judge agrees that it's relevant, uh, the, 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 the other party that may have that data, is, uh, is, to my knowledge of the law, is obliged to comply. 
Uh, this can also happen in bitter divorce cases. And you know, marketing spam can just randomly show up uh, at your door, or if you have products shipped to your work, embarrassing catalogs can start showing up uh, at your work, which has actually happened to me, uh, of ba based on stuff that you have uh, purchased and have had shipped to your work because it's convenient to have that South Ord, you know, lockpick set sent to your work, so you can just pick it up or whatever, uh, rather than have it risk it being stolen at your apartment or whatever. So, uh, all sorts of all sorts of sticky issues with, with privacy that basic that normal people need to be concerned about. Okay, so what is Tor? Quick overview uh, for those of you who might not be familiar. There have been five, uh, you know, four hours of Tor talk so far. But just a quick recap: you run a client, the Tor client, that acts as a SOX proxy that you connect your applications to. Uh, when your applications connect to this SOX proxy, they issue, uh, they're translated into uh, what Tor calls streams. These streams are then multiplex on top of encrypted paths that are, uh, that Tor calls circuits. Um, and then these circuits are in turn multiplexed over TLS SSL connections between the individual relay nodes uh, that are run by volunteers uh, all over the world. Uh, these circuits, these paths that your client chooses, consists of three nodes, what, what's called the guard node, the relay or middle node, and then the exit. These nodes are, cho are, are chosen probabilistically by your client proportional to their bandwidth. Uh, so here's a, here's a diagram that illustrates uh, some properties, some important, the important multiplexing properties that I talked about before. You have two clients essentially choosing two different circuits or paths through the network going through this first hop called the guard node. The reason for that, that term I'll get into later. These two clients are, are multiplexed over the same TLS connection in this middle hop between the guard and the relay. Uh, and then they diverge off uh, at the relay onto different exits. Now the second client has that T, the, the, the TCP socks over uh, uh, being multiplexed over, over this circuit being routed through the second path and it goes through the single circuit who the individual p uh, hops of which are unable to see that there are multiple streams on the circuit uh, other than timing information uh, until it is finally split up by the exit node to connect to whatever maybe a couple of fetches from the same server or a couple of different servers. The below diagram it illustrates essentially the crypto behind this and why it is that the guard node doesn't know who your exit node is. Essentially, each node publishes a series of, of public keys in the, the Tor directory, and then your client uses these public keys to negotiate uh, a, layered a layered encrypted channel to each successive hop. So first you negotiate a secret key, uh, first you make the TLS connection to node X, then you negotiate a secret key uh, with node X. Through that channel, you tell node X, please uh, help me negotiate a secret key with, uh, and make a connection to node Y. And then through, through encrypting with that secret key, you then instruct node Y to extend uh, to node Z and negotiate another secret key. And this process of, you know, of, of adding additional hops to your path in Tor uh, parlance is known as circuit extending. Uh, and you can iteratively extend your circuit uh, effectively as long as you want. And I believe there was there was one attack uh, uh, to try and uh, essentially DOS the network by making infinite paths. There may I think there are some protections against that, but uh, uh, I'm not entirely familiar with with uh, what those are. Um, Roger can probably offer that up uh, uh, during Q and A or whatever. Uh, Passive attacks. Uh, so, for for as far as how to how to secure this network. So, in order to secure this the, the the Tor network, we really have to look at it from you know an attacker's point of view. We have to understand the types of attacks, the motivation of the attacker, uh, what the you know what the attacker is going to do, and how he's going to do it. So, first, we should classify these attacks as a, as to what what sort of actions the a attacker is going to do. Are they going to just observe traffic, or are they going to actively modify traffic? So, under under just observing traffic, we have things like uh, packet and timing uh, connection timing correlation, looking at things like when does the when does the connection start, how many packets are involved, the the pattern of those packets, and when does it finish. Uh, 
We also have things like fingerprinting, noting the the what a what a what a particular website fetch looks like through Tor. Uh, fetch of a uh, Wikipedia a particular Wikipedia page may exhibit a particular uh, fingerprinting pattern, a particular pattern of cells of of encrypted packets that a guard node or an ISP is able to just recognize. Intersection attacks are more subtle and more broad. Basically, this is something that you can do passively to catalog a bunch of different attributes of, of users and, and add all those attributes up. Um, active attacks include things like lying about your bandwidth to get more traffic. As I said, our, your path through Tor is you, you choose your, your nodes probabilistically according to the, the ba advertised bandwidth that a node says it can carry. If, so if the node says it can carry more traffic, then you have a higher probability of choosing them and that, that node should get more clients connecting to it. Uh, failing circuits to bias node selection, that's another one. Uh, you can try and modify uh, how, the, how the path is, is chosen by a client by failing circuits arbitrarily. And um, you can modify application uh, layer traffic at the exit to do things like insert plugins. And we'll be getting into more of these specific examples in more detail later. This is basically just to understand this classification idea. So the position of the attack is, a, is another uh, variable, another dimension on the, on the classification of these attacks. You can have an internal adversary that is a node operator that is able to see inside and say, okay, well, they can see past that TLS multiplexing and see the individual circuits that are flowing through their node. Um, they're also, at the exit node, they're also able to see past the, the stream on top of circuit multiplexing uh, and, and say, be able to determine which streams are, are, are associated to a particular circuit. This uh, ability gives them, uh, uh, has, has certain attacks that sort of fall out of that, which we'll get to later as well. Uh, the external adversary is an ISP or Echelon uh, style adversary. The, they are able to absor observe large portions of the Tor network uh, or you know, uh, multiple nodes, but they're assumed to be unable to see inside the node-to-node -node TLS uh, streams. Um, and it has yet, it's yet to be proven, but it is likely that due to a couple of factors, uh, uh, in my opinion, that, that these sorts of adversaries should be frustrated by users who run Tor nodes and as both, their, as both a node and for their client usage. The reason for this is essentially um, the three main characteristics for a successful timing attack have been demonstrated to be uh, the, start of the, the time of the start of the stream, essentially the number of packets, and the end of the stream. And if you, have, uh, if you are running a node, you are going to be multiplexing other people's traffic through, uh, through that node. An external adversary is only going to be able to see these TLS connections Queuing delays are going to come into effect and cause uh, issues with the adversary being able to tell the exact start of when, when your connection started. Uh, they're going to ha uh, make it difficult to determine the number of packets in that connection, even if they're observe trying to calculate the differences between packets uh, entering and leaving. If your traffic is throttled at a constant rate, this is going to frustrate them to some degree, to some unknown degree. Maybe a possibly marginal, but I think it, it, it should be, there, there should, there, there's some, some hope there. So where can Tor, where does this look like if we look at that, that same path diagram that I displayed earlier? Um, Obviously, there's a lot of places that Tor can be attacked. In fact, it can be attacked pretty much everywhere. Uh, possibly even there should be some arrows for these uh, TLS links. They are only 1024-bit RSA keys, and some nodes have been around for a real long time, five, five-ish years. Uh, the age of the network uh, is, I believe, five, six years. Um, so we're starting to get close to what, in my opinion, would be a comfortable lifetime for a 1024-bit RSA key. I believe there are plans in success to allow uh, versioning of the, of the protocol and possibly allow multi-sized uh, and alternate keys. Uh, this was at least discussed uh, on IRC uh, at one point. <laughs> um, so to break this down into a bit more detail, obviously there's a lot of things going down, uh, on here. We're going to look at individual cases of, of relevant attacks. So here's some passive attacks uh, from that, basically extracted from that previous diagram. Um, so at the top we have intersection attacks, and these are essentially performed independent of the Tor network, maybe with knowledge, just the knowledge of the fact that a user uses Tor, and then on the other side, um, 
uh, there's a connection made from a Tor IP to a to a server, and the user may do things like uh, reveal. Uh, their time zone information, or maybe say that they work at a particular company, or um, re otherwise reveal personal information that uh, some uh, some level of vague personal information that over time can add up to eventually identify them. Uh, at the bottom, we have both uh, internal and external uh, timing correlation attacks. Um, now these can be performed by, as I said, an external adversary that is either an ISP or uh, some, something observing the uh, internet exchange or um, backbone routers. Or, or it can also be performed by the nodes themselves who are able to see the mat try and match up individual circuits. Uh, Active attacks. Now, these are the, some of the more deadly attacks. A uh, couple of academic papers uh, revolve around this. Um, one by Parisa Tabriz, uh, Nikita Borisov, and George Danzeis uh, to basically argued that reliability is essentially the same as uh, security when you're talking about mixed networks. Uh, an adversary who's able to, f to fail a uh, large amount of circuits can bias your, begin to bias your path selection, and, 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 and in this case, uh, you can see that if they own the guard node, they can fail circuits at the guard node if it doesn't extend to a relay node that they, uh, that they uh, control. And then at the relay node, they can fail those circuits if it doesn't extend to an exit node that, that they control. Uh, they can also attempt to find uh, a side channel in the, in the Tor protocol. One potential side channel is to XOR a piece of the, the, the uh, protocol stream at the guard node. And as this circuit flow, as this packet flow, flows through the network, the, uh, when it reaches the, uh, an exit node, its digest is, is, is verified. And if the digest vi uh, verification fails, that circuit fails. So a malicious exit node then, who is colluding with that guard node, can then potentially unXOR that same byte in the stream. And then those two nodes will, can guarantee that they're only going to ca carry traffic that they really want to own. Um, they can also combine this, as uh, Damon McCoy uh, demonstrated, uh, and a few other researchers from University of Colorado uh, demonstrated in, in his work, on uh, their work, that bandwidth lying can come into play here. And they, uh, they basically demonstrate that very, with very, low, very few resources, you can sort of combine these two attacks and uh, cause people to, to try and use you and continually fail your cir their circuits until, um, until uh, they, uh, they, they do choose an exit node that, that, you, that uh, they control. Now the Tor, I, I should clarify that this, that, whoops, that uh, the Tor exit node, uh, uh, Tor code does print out, I believe, a notice if, if, uh, if the digest fails. So this is not something that just can happen all over the place without us knowing, uh, even at this point. This is something that can be detected. But um, there, there, it's possible that there are other side channels involving timing information that are more difficult to detect. Guard node bias is another layer that can be added to this. An adversary at an organization or a, uh, a, a government can try and either block Tor entirely, or more sinister, a um, more sinister approach maybe to just allow access to the guard nodes that they control that fail circuits uh, that don't that that don't extend to the nodes that they're colluding with. Uh, application uh, layer attacks. Uh, surveillance and confiscation is one. If your browser, is, if you live in a country that may have somehow, uh, that may have outlawed Tor, Germany has some nebulous laws that were recently passed that may or may not fall into this category. Uh, some other countries as well uh, actively block Tor. It's, it's, it's conceivable that uh, uh, others may try and harass users that, that, that try to use Tor. Uh, the, in, these, in these situations, a confiscation of those Tor users' computers may prove profitable to try and reveal browser history information, cache information, or what have you. Client misconfiguration is sort of a, a passive attack. If uh, a user uses a Sox pro uh, the Sox proxy and properly uses a, the Sox 4 version of, of, of uh, the, the, the protocol, instead of 4A or 5, DNS requests can happen locally over the network. And then that uh, the resolved IP is then fed to Tor. Um, 
in this case, you've you've basically leaked the host names of the of the sites that you're visiting. Um, for the web for the web browser scenario, the the Tor extension does may verify that things are configured properly. But for other applications, uh, the, you know it's up to the user to essentially ensure that they're doing this right. Uh, Tor does provide, print out a notice. However, again, in that case, if it's being consistently fed only IP addresses, so if you're watching your Vidalia log window or whatever, you can see that this is the case. Oh, I've, mis I've misconfigured things. Uh, application layer attacks um, involve things like, in as I said, injecting plugins. Plugins are horrible about bypassing, uh, obeying your proxy settings, uh, which I'll discuss in more detail later, the individual breakdown of how exactly how horrible these plugins are. Uh, also uh, things like w having JavaScript that waits for events uh, for, uh, for when you disable Tor or just busy waits until you disable Tor, things like that. Okay, so that's basically a, a rundown of all the attacks um, uh, uh, that, that this presentation is going to discuss. Are there any, any, any questions on, uh, thoughts on Tax, any anything that pops in your mind about those? Yeah. Uh, I'm unclear on the question. Are you asking what sort of information Tor may be logging at, at the nodes or? No. No, there is a there is actually a, a false rumor going on to that effect. Uh, there is no the, the there is no backdoors in Tor to satisfy that. Uh, there and there have been no requirements uh, on Tor node operators to actually log uh, any sort of traffic. Um, there have been a, a, a couple of waves of se node seizures uh, of of nodes on the Tor network. Uh, that, to my knowledge, all of those machines were returned within a day or two, uh, and most of the I believe most of those nodes are are again operational. Of course, after rotating their uh, you know refreshing their node keys and whatnot. Yeah. Okay, um, the, that is an excellent point. Then, thank you. Uh, the point the point was, I guess, for I don't know if there are people who are would be viewing the podcast or whatever this talk um, that that uh, essentially all of Europe has has these sorts of has has this sort of le uh, legislation. For I guess the EU uh, has handed it down, and, and several countries have also implemented uh, similar similar sorts of legislation. So, the European Council. Oh, okay. Okay. The oh, so the no, the client is something that you run locally. So it will be using your IP address to connect to the guard node. So the guard node uh, will see your IP address. Uh, so yeah, so that at the when the guard connects to the relay, it will be using a you know a different IP address. And additionally, the TCP streams are also. Uh, uh, essentially reuse so the TCP fingerprinting attacks uh, don't apply the end end TCP fingerprinting attacks also don't apply okay uh, I think we'll move on to uh, approaches uh, how do we how do we how do we address some of these problems or you know how do we address these problems uh, well the first approach while the network was smaller was to try and verify node operators that um, that you know either legitimate you know we, the network operator or the network uh, maintainers would know who they are 
um, and if there was some trouble with their node, they could be easily contacted. This is no longer the case. Essentially, you can just go to Vidalia and say, yes, I want to run a Tor node, and then it sets up your uh, configuration appropriately. Um, for the, no the network has essentially just grown too large for, for uh, verification to be applicable uh, at all, and, and hopefully we can continue to grow it larger. Uh, path selection and hacks, there's a couple of different ways that your path uh, can be, is, is, is chosen uh, in a specific manner by the client and certain restrictions are placed on, placed on your path for security. Uh, Tor up from the floor up, this is essentially the slogan of AnonymOS. Um, this, the idea is that if something can fit through uh, Tor, uh, you know, shove it through Tor, and if it doesn't, you know, drop it on the floor. So any UDP traffic, anything that might be bypassing uh, plug-in settings or what have you is dropped. And there are a few different products, uh, 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 projects that do this. Uh, improving speed, network speed and usability is an important component of anonymity to have large amounts of users using the network. Um, and scanning nodes for modification, make sure they're not uh, modifying traffic at the exit node and make sure that they are reliable, they're not overloaded and such things like that. Uh, and then finally, securing the applications, uh, trying to make sure that the web browser is not going to magically bypass proxy settings, that JavaScript is not going to do mysterious things. Um, unfortunately, this requires a different threat model that applications don't often consider. And we'll get into all these uh, one by one in a bit more detail. Uh, so starting with path selection hacks, there's a couple of hacks that, that, that Tor has, uh, uh, does. Uh, the slash 16 hack, uh, when you're choosing a path, no two nodes in that path can be from the same slash 16 net mask. So the idea is if uh, someone is do, trying to do what's called a Sybil attack, which is running multiple uh, nodes from you know the, a colo provider or uh, even on their same on the, on, a, on their cable modem, um, this prevents them from uh, easily being able to uh, have a large number of nodes on the network. Um, that are going to be able to actively compromise users in this way. It also um, prevents um, ISP, ISPs from being able to easily uh, surveil uh, traffic. Now, the, the caveat is obviously that some ISPs have disjoint, especially the larger ISPs, have disjoint IP ranges, and they're not always in the same slash as team, but it does, you know, that's not to say that this is completely ineffective. It is, it is some measure of, of protection against uh, uh, some, somebody mounting a trivial uh, Sybil attack with multiple, uh, multiple nodes, all, all from the same you know, rack or whatever. Guard nodes, the fir as you notice, the first node in that path is called a guard. These are chosen from the top 50% uptime and top 50% bandwidth of the network. Uh, they, the, I, the idea is that, well, initially they were, I believe they were designed, uh, they were called helper nodes, um, and the idea was to uh, mitigate uh, profiling attacks. So essentially, so as Nick Matthewson mentioned uh, in his talk, uh, essentially you don't want if, if you never want somebody to know that if you're you know some uh, Harley rider it was his example, and you like to visit Cute Overload, and you can continually visit uh, if you, you continually visit this site every morning, you never want anybody to be able to determine this. Uh, if you are continually choosing new entry and exit points all the time, eventually, with some probability, someone will notice that you're visiting Cute overload and uh, uh, will you know be able to tell all your biker buddies and embarrass you or what, what have you however you want to generalize that example um, so having a fixed set of guard nodes between two and three is the goal uh, can can make sure that you're not going to be exposed to the whole network in this way and you can you can uh, in, a, in essence build up sort of trust in your guards and if there is, is an intimidation attack where some guards try and uh, capture uh, and harass a bunch of users if you're not harassed in this way you, your, your rational response is oh well I trust my guards even more than I can trust Tor even more than assuming that it was a you know end-to-end -end, uh, attack uh, the problem is that that nodes can go up and these guard no nodes can go up and down in general so this can be difficult to do right you can have uh, basically uh, a time trade-off of risk. If, if you are still rotating through the network because these things are going up and down, you can still be exposed to the, a large amount of the network for a short period of time. And there are a couple of hacks in how uh, Tor remembers guard nodes to try and prevent this now. So this is, this is less of an issue than it was about a month or so ago. 
uh, tour routers and live CDs. Uh, there are a few of these. Uh, one is being uh, presented immediately following this talk. Um, Janus VM is an uh, Anonymous OS, and, and the Zero Bank Virtual Machine are, the, I think, the major examples of these guys. Um, again, drop, basically drop everything that doesn't uh, go through Tor. The major issue with these uh, is, is that circuit reuse can be a very uh, problematic uh, situation. If you are using antivirus software that updates with a unique identifier, if you have other ID-based software updates or you use AIM or you SSH into a shell that has your name in the domain name or you, you connect to an email account that's, that uh, you don't want linked with your anonymous traffic, an exit node can figure this out and begin to associate them. Uh, now, this, there is a, a new NIM functionality in Vidalia that you can click on and say, okay, I, I want a new, a new identity now. Um, but, you know, th that's sort of up to the user to be able to differentiate and remember to click on that button, and it, it, it can be, it can be uh, problematic, especially if you are routing all of your applications through, through like a Tor router, for example. Um, now, Speed and usability, is, uh, as I touched on, is, is a key component to Tor security. You want as large a user base as, as possible. In fact, there have been cases in the past where uh, users have been harassed because they, they uh, in fact, there's an example of a professor who was harassed because there were only two Tor users from his university, and it was suspected that one of them was engaging in an online scam. And so the campus police and possibly some state or federal police uh, contacted him and you know, asked him if it, he was a professor who taught about uh, censorship and censorship resistance. And they had asked him what sort of, what, what if any students he knew of were still actively using Tor and, uh, and, and basically interrogated him. So there's this risk of harassment and there's also the risk of, say, a blogger who blog, wants to blog about work but then brings their laptop to work, and they're the only Tor user from their uh, at their workplace. They're, it's very easy for the system administrator to see. Okay, this is the only internal IP address that we have connecting to the Tor network. Um, you know, we we have a pretty good idea of who this anonymous blogger, who may or may not be causing us problems, is, uh, and who their identity, what their identity is. So, how do you improve this? Basically, users want speed, the network to be fast. And they want it to be easy. So a lot, uh, it's my argument that a lot of them, you know, don't need ha such high-grade anonymity. I suspect that a lot of them are, you know, are concerned about this, the data hygiene issue. Like they want to just opt out of a, of a few Google queries, or they want to opt out of, you know, vi uh, ordering something. They won't, don't want marketers to have their IP address, or they don't want. Um, IMDb or whatever to have uh, what movies they like or these sorts of things. Um, so for this reason, I proposed uh, a a two hot pass pro proposal. The most uh, deadly attack um, from a from a from a high level point of view or from a theoretical point of view is the timing correlation attack. Now this this is effective between 95 and 99.9 percent .9 in in simulation. Uh, you can get that much certainty f to correlate streams that are entering and exiting the, 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 the Tor network. Um, so from a theoretical point of view, there's little reason why there should be three hops as opposed to two. But there are a lot of implementation details that can sort of co that can complicate these things. Uh, on the conference CD, there, I, do ha I have included this proposal. If you want to look through that, I have a reasoning of, of what, what some of these major issues are and what can be done about them. Uh, to, to, to try and improve things from an implementation perspective. These include things like you know, the, the active circuit failure issue. They include things like uh, a, the go, a user using a, an exit with a specific exit policy that exits to, to a particular IP address. Um, and, and basically the, you know, those, sorts of, those sorts of issues. Uh, intelligent pass selection is something that's being worked on by one of our Google Summer of Code uh, uh, students, uh, this is basically that uh, you can tr to try and have the client intelligently determine uh, what the latency is between different uh, Tor nodes and try and build higher latency pass or lower latency pass and higher ba bandwidth pass for users that say, well, I, we don't need as much anonymity. We just want to be able to fetch web, web websites fast, and we just want IP address obfuscation essentially. Um, 
Last point to improving speed and usability, which we're going to go into a bit more detail, is in ensuring the network is, is evenly balanced and reliable. It turns out there's a lot of balancing issues with Tor, which is why it's uh, uh, slow for a, 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 a large amount, uh, you know, a certain percentage of the users experience rough Tor performance. Uh, so how do we deter, how, how can we try and detect some of these m mischievous nodes and what have we found so far? So centralized network scanning is, is essentially using what's called the Tor control port to determine um, the Tor control port is a is a port that the Tor exports that allows you to build your own circuits through Tor uh, and get events on circuit failure and get events on uh, uh, and, and attach streams to circuits that you build and get events on bandwidth usage and so on. So. Uh, Snakes on a Tor was a, a node scan, or is a node scanner that I've built, uh, and Torflow is a is a Python library that uh, interacts with the Tor control port and allows you to selectively build paths. Uh, Snakes on a Tor, uh, essentially the goal of sna that 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 scanner is to get the motherfucking snakes off the motherfucking Tor. <laughs> to to verify MD5 sums of, of URLs that you fetch, make sure that nobody is inserting malicious uh, plugins or JavaScript or um, modifying, inserting uh, exploits into documents or uh, uh, Firefox extensions or what have you. Um, this all, uh, we are also at the same time re verifies node reliability and bandwidth uh, to try and find detect those circuit failure attacks. Um, and it, it has found some things, uh, but uh, for the most part, it works against uh, adversaries that are attacking, you know, pretty much everybody. But there are there, are, but it is vulnerable to detection, and there are some issues with adversaries that are only tar there are issues with adversaries that are only targeting a select portion of the user base, like users who speak a particular language that the scanner does not speak, like Chinese. Um, so. What does this look like from a you know from a network diagram point of view? Again, what is the scanner doing? What's it able to detect? Is outlaid uh, on the top. Uh, you can detect node bias and connectivity issues, circuit failure and bandwidth, as I said, and uh, content modification. But at the bottom, we have the arms race essentially. Uh, the adversary is able to tell that you're not making circuits the same way as they as you. Uh, as a normal Tor user, because you're not using guard nodes anymore, you're connecting to every Tor node that you can uh, to try and verify its reliability. So the, Tor, the guard nodes are going to be able to, set, to tell, oh, well, this was a short-lived connection from this IP, and it continually connects to me for only a short period of time and then moves on. Uh, it can then note this IP and provide its special selective service, higher bandwidth, not fail at circuits, or what have you. Uh, similarly, the exit node can detect uh, behavioral issues in the URLs that you fetch. Maybe you don't fetch the images for a page, maybe you don't interpret JavaScript, or you're missing HTTP, some HTTP headers. Uh, so, and it can also try and evade your, uh, your scanning, again, use, either using this detection or only targeting only specific users. Uh, likewise, dynamic and localized content is a problem for scanning. If you're just verifying MD5s and the content of a page is continually changing, like Google News or uh, localized uh, localized websites for in particular languages, these become uh, both false positive, either false positives for the scanner and or opportune targets for uh, malicious nodes to just sort of attack uh, essentially with impunity. Um, but stuff we found anyway. That some of this this is pretty interesting. We found a a Chinese ISP man in the middleing uh, SSL. So it was a particular Tor node that exhibited uh, self signed SSL certificates to every uh, uh, SSL site that it visited. And Tor uh, Tor the, the snakes on a Tor does in fact verify these SSL certificates and stores a bunch of them for a handful of sites and verifies that the same. We detected uh, this. This ISP doing it wasn't the node. It turned out that this ISP, for some reason, was just trying to own all of its uh, clients. Uh, Pop-up blocking. Some of the some nodes run uh, antivirus software. So far, has been exhibited in, in Windows users only. So it must be some sort of antivirus software. Inserts JavaScript into pages that are fetched to hook the uh, window.open call to block some some uh, forms of JavaScript pop-ups. Um, 
So that's sort of helpful, but then it also may, it makes things problematic. Do we whitelist these nodes? And then maybe from scanning, but then maybe they have the opportunity to do other uh, malicious activity or malicious nodes can look like this behavior. So that, that complicates things a bit. Uh, so one node in particular, one node was also uh, blocking Google Analytics uh, JavaScript, um, which I thought was amusing. Um, so the, the Google Analytics JavaScript wasn't able to tell or you know, add the, tor that that IP to whatever statistics that website uh, owner uh, would want to get about you know th their users. Uh, DNS spoofing has been detected. Uh, SSH and SSL man in the middle. There was a few uh, Tor nodes that the, they seemed to come in pairs that were uh, man in the middleing SSH and SSL. These were uh, detected and and listed as bad exits. Um, and overloaded nodes have also been detected, and some balancing issues as well were detected, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, turns out that there's quite a, there should be quite a bit more capacity on the network than a lot of users are currently experiencing. Incidentally, uh, when we do find these nodes, we are able to label them as malicious and prevent clients from actually choosing them in the future. So we have two different tags that, that, that can do that, the bad exit tag and the, uh, the removing of the valid tag which the bad exit prevents them from being used as, a, as, a, as an exit, and removing the valid tag prevents them from being used as either a guard or an exit. So how do we, how do we address some of the, the issues of trying to, uh, of this arms race of, of adversaries that are able to detect scanning and provide selective service? So uh, from, uh, there, there are a couple of different uh, perspectives that we can approach this from, uh, client-based uh, decentralized scanning and node-based decentralized scanning. Client-based decentralized scanning, uh, we can use the reliability averages from Torflow and then alert the user if, a guard, if their guard is failing more than that percentage of circuits or that percentage of circuits times you know, the you know, two times the, the standard deviation or whatever. Um, also, we can uh, alert them if they can only connect to two guards, for example, or two guards that uh, fit with their f whatever firewall restrictions that they may have. Um, we can also uh, potentially um, observe the bandwidth and latency of their connection, but that gets a little nebulous for different types of users. Node-based scanning can do things like gather statistics uh, from on average capacity and queue lengths and compare that to the node rankings and make sure that uh, nodes match up to um, you know, what, what their expected capacity should be and they don't have large disparity between their, their, uh, how much they dequeue and, uh, and how much uh, is being enqueued to them. Um, and then the, the, this sort of node-based information can be used as a feedback loop to improve balancing as well. So, Passive uh, client node node based scanning can, looks essentially like this. You have uh, three different clients here in this example uh, that are that are able to detect a few different things about their network. In this top case, uh, you have this client who's able to detect that all he's got a high rate of failure uh, to his uh, uh, the, this first hop that's maliciously failing circuits. The second uh, node is able to say, well, I, I can only connect to a few no, uh, guard nodes and all the other connections seem to fail. No other explanation like uh, restrictive firewalls for port-based for port firewalls or, ever, what, or anything else seems to explain this. Um, print out a warning, alert the user. And then the bottom is the more nebulous case, doubtful how, to what degree that th this, this, this may be successful, uh, trying to detect um, uh, a, a lying node that is lying about its bandwidth um, that may exhibit uh, lower stream rates or maybe higher amounts of, of timeouts than normal. On, on this sort, in, the, in the center, you have a, a, a node scanner that is again listening to those events on their control port. Uh, potential events that we can add are the are, are queue rate of uh, queue size, rate of I increase, and rate of drain uh, to to detect overloaded nodes and lying nodes will probably will end up appearing pretty much the same. We can also detect, have, gather statistics on what is the rate of failure through to circuits that are created through me and, and report failing circuit, uh, nodes that fail circuits that way as well. Um, so balancing issues, as I, as I mentioned, sc through scanning we're able to, to determine the, the Tor network is unbalanced. There is in fact a guard, a bug in versions less than one to 
01215, uh, bug number 440 on the, 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 the tour project, um, bug uh, fly spray, bugzilla equivalent. Uh, essentially, the issue is that nodes were, uh, guard nodes were accidentally being chosen uh, uniformly across the guard node space rather than weighted by their bandwidth. And this has several issues as far as reliability and user experience. Um, also, there's a bandwidth clipping issue. The limit, there's a limit on how high we're, we're, we are going to believe what the bandwidth of a given node is uh, in order, you know, so that nodes can't show up and say, oh, I have a terabyte of bandwidth. Send me all your Tor traffic. Um, it's currently clipped at 1.5 megabytes a second. There are about 32 d uh, nodes that have capacities in, ex in excess of 1.5 megabits, uh, megabytes a second. Um, so that's essentially uh, wasted capacity. So what are the results from, from scans? Uh, it turns out that the top 5% of these nodes have essentially have room for um, about 7 times more capacity, and the next 10% have room for about uh, 3 times more capacity. We'll get into the, grab the breakdowns of that by percentile and, and how that was done uh, in these successive slides. Um, there are also high circuit failure rates that drop off uh, that stop uh, at about the point where you, nodes are no longer considered for guard status. Um, there are also uh, uh, high extend, higher than normal extend times beyond this 50% mark as well. So how is this scanning done? Uh, essentially we divide the Tor network into five percentile ranges. Uh, about 80 nodes per, the, per range and build uh, in the case of circuit scanning and scanning for circuit failures, build about 500 three-hop paths for, for each of these 80 nodes and fetch a small file through each, of, uh, through each path. We count the number of failures and track the extend times through this. Bandwidth scanning is similar. Fetch a 512K file 200 times over two-hop two paths and average you know, the, the bandwidth that we observed through that. So what does this look like? What does this misbalancing look like? And what are some of the effects for users? Uh, this is the breakdown of node bandwidth by these five percentile ranges. You can see it follows the typical power law statistics, uh, exponential drop off of, 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 of the amount of, of bandwidth that nodes are able to provide. Turns out the first five percent of the nodes provide about 45 percent of the bandwidth. The next 10 percent after that provide about 30 percent of the bandwidth and then these rest of these guys provide the remainder 25 percent. Now the average stream rate, uh, stream bandwidth also seems to follow this, this statistic even though in a balanced network every stream should, uh, every node should be re receiving traffic proportional to its, uh, its capacity. So you have the, the the, again, the, seven, the 7x more capacity, the average cap stream capacity for the rest of the network past you know, this, this range is about 10 kilobytes a second, as you can see this, uh, uh, from this diagram. And the first 5%, the average capacity is, is 75 kilobytes a second for some reason. And then right in the next 10% the, the next after that has uh, uh, about 30 kilobytes a second. Uh, so what does this look like in terms of circuit failure? Again, you can see steadily rising circuit failure till about the 50th percentile of, uh, of the network where nodes stop being considered for guard status and then it drops off. There's a mysterious blip on the radar here at about 25%. I'm still, I looked at a number of factors that I'll show in, in successive slides. Still, I'm still not sure exactly what, what the cause of this is. It, 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 um, it, it remains a mystery. It, it, it's not time of day or uptime or anything like this. It could be that this just happens to be a sweet spot for, for a certain class of users for rate limiting their Tor node, and for some reason these users don't exhibit that circuit failure. You can also see that extend times are reasonable, again, in this top 15% of the network, but then they start to spike and continue to rise uh, up until about the, the point where uh, they are nodes are no longer considered for guard status, and then they drop shar sharply off after the, the guard status uh, flag is, is no longer uh, possible. So what does this mean from a usability standpoint? Uh, uh, so I actually did, did you know, a couple of calculations, and 
Turns out that about there's about a there, there's a 70 percent chance of choosing a pretty badly unbalanced guard, and the, where that number comes from, as you see here, from the, where the extend times really begin to pick up, is around this 15, and then all the way up to the 50th percentile. And then every user is going to choose a guard from the zero to 50th percentile. So 15 to 50 is 35. Uh, 35 percent double at is 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 70. The tour the goal of tour is to maintain three guards. So for existing clients that have already chosen their guards, they have uh, a 34% chance of choosing three unbalanced guards. So what this means is for 34% of the users, Tor is likely unbearable. And anecdotally, this is the case as well. A friend of mine actually uh, convinced her to install Tor. Uh, she comes back to me about a month later and she says, well, you know what, I, my, my, my internet connection was, I thought it was broken for a week. And it turns out I just left. I just had left Tor on. <laughs> so for 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 34 percent of the users, they they are likely experiencing some pretty uh, uh, extreme pain until users begin to update and and choose guards based on uh, based on this bandwidth waiting. And then further statistics: uh, three choose two uh, times the probability of choosing one uh, not so highly loaded guard. You have a Three times 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 uh, times 0 0.3, or 44 percent chance of choosing two out of three bad guards. So for 44 percent of users, Tor is going to be uh, going to build circuits. Uh, 66 percent of the circuits are going to be slow. 33 percent are going to be reasonable, and then 19 percent are going to have one bad guard, and only three percent of the users are probably going to have a, a, a reasonable guard. So other uh, factors of load balancing, uh, insane exit policies, uh, allowing BitTorrent, peer-to-peer uh, -peer traffic, and SMTP are big factors in nodes that are failing a lot of circuits as well. I was able to determine that. Unfortunately, um, some of these are also hard to see beyond the, the, that initial noise of, of the circuit failure uh, due to the, this balancing issue. Um, high uptime versus low uptime, this is probably a factor in that if you're a guard node and you're running for a while, Users are going to choose you and hold on to you for as long as they can. After a while, if you run for longer than everybody else in the network, you're going to attract a disproportional number of users. They're going to use you. Um, so far, this doesn't seem to be a definitive uh, statistic, probably because guard nodes are, 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 do go up and down. Um, but I, I haven't looked at, at uh, this in a lot of detail, but again, because it's hard to see through the noise. Um, scarce guard bandwidth. Uh, uh, their guard uh, guard node bandwidth turns out makes out about makes up about 40 percent of the network bandwidth. Would be nice to avoid these things for the relay choice. That's just a possibility, uh, just so that they're not being used when in, in positions where uh, or or like lower their probability of being chosen for for non guard positions because they don't uh, they they are a somewhat scarce resource. They're greater than a third of the bandwidth, but the, the that remainder should probably be weighted accordingly to to that seven percent that's left over. Directory versus node traffic, nodes that are directory mirrors. Um, the balancing between those two may or may not be an issue. Uh, and time of day and location are potential possibilities that could explain some of these blips. Like in here, it's po I did run these scans over a number of days. It's possible this was uh, daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. So that's a possibility. I did try rerunning this one at a 12-hour offset from when it first showed up, and this was not that was not an issue on, on this blip. So. Uh, so questions about the balancing issues, usability issues of of the of guards, uh, and or, or, net, or any network scanning questions. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So if you if you want to try and uh, if you are used to it and you think that yeah, a lot of the time it is slow uh, and, it's, and it's variations on slowness. What you can do is try and find this 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 state file and just you just remove that. Tor will choose new guards proportionally bad. That's probably the best thing that uh, for you. And then guard Tor, the newer versions of Tor will choose guards proportionally bandwidth, and you have a higher probability of choosing those those uh, lessly weighted guards. And at some point, we uh, I'm, I believe we will expire uh, the guards. That you know of, of users for that it chose them prior to that that o two one five fifteen version. So at that at that point the network should just what am I, as far as I can tell should magically rebalance, and then hopefully everything will be a lot better. 
and there should be four. Oh, the other math, the other piece of math is that there should be about four times more capacity, either for more users or more bandwidth per user. So a, a current estimate is 200,000 users. Should be room for eight, maybe 800,000, but there's a lot of factors in there that you know you can't really say that for sure. There's an economic factor. Uh, of user, some users will put up with a certain amount of speed, and then you have that sort of supply versus demand type curve. Stephen Murdoch po posted some nice graphs on that sort of uh, uh, behavior to the to the OR talk list. Yeah, so it is it is done probabilistically. So uh, you know, if you weighted by the bandwidth, uh, unfortunately, all, the only metric we have right now is what nodes say that they are observing that they are uh, are are carrying. Um, but we are able to detect liars, as I said, by the fact that that um, they exhibit the, the the lower stream bandwidth. Now there's potential for a sort of a feedback loop there. So you can say, oh well, these guys are exhibiting a higher amount of circuit failure uh, via those decentralized mechanism scanning. Uh, avoid them. Uh, these these have more capacity and sort of dynamically rebalance to try and deal with the, the nuances uh, of of uh, what might not be accounted for by that just basic probabilistic uh, weighting. But that's something that's further down the road after we fix you know these these basic issues. Yeah. Scan. Uh, it, I believe if you search the OR talk it, uh, archives, its name was one. So the subject was, oh my god, I found one, or something like this, <laughs> right after I had announced the, the snakes on a tour. So I found, I found a snake, and I was all excited. So there's that post where you can laugh at me or whatever. Right. OK. Um, the SSA, uh, I should I should clarify though, the SSH man in the middle was actually observed uh, initially independent of the scanner. Somebody, uh, I want have a day job, not able to uh, consistent, consistently watch this stuff. Turns out somebody found the SSH man in the middle. We were able to detect it reappearing uh, at other dates under different names. So they, they, they gave up shortly after the, the person found them on the mailing list, and then they tried again a bit later, and we found them then. So. Okay, so the application layer. This is I've done some work on Tor button to try and secure the web browser. Um, so what what sort of things go into uh, securing the application layer of Tor? Uh, Tor has a, basically a a superset of the threat model that that most applications were written for. Um, no UDP and unique identifiers are bad. Have to obey the proxy settings. Uh, location information um, is. is uh, it shouldn't be translated. It shouldn't leak your time zone. Updates are dangerous, um, and uh, you know it, it, it's there. It's a hostile network essentially. This last one is uh, a couple of these do apply to other scenarios as well. Um, proxy settings for for web are, are kind of important. I think in in so from JavaScript malware these days, we have a corporate. Uh, Internet that you would like to pr protect from from JavaScript that is able to scan your the host on your network proxy settings and a, and a browser that obeys them it, it would be a nice thing to have. Uh, uh, Firefox does have this property. Uh, past versions of IE uh, have questionable behavior in this regard. Where we haven't yet re-examined the current behavior of it, but updates again. Some Firefox extensions aren't sent over SSL. That was in the press recently. So. What sort of things are uh, are are dangerous uh, from from the the from a web-based attacker? Uh, bypassing proxy settings is the main one. This can be done with um, Java, essentially JavaScript events and um, uh, plugins. Plugins are horrible at at obeying their even their own proxy settings. Um, JavaScript meta refresh is another one waiting for Tor to be disabled and setting a really long meta refresh timer or a continual like refresh loop. Uh, correlation of Tor versus non-Tor. This can be done some surprising uh, ways. Uh, cache is one. Uh, you can embed a unique identifier in a, in a, in a document you serve through um, 
uh, through a tour node, and then that you need, you can inspect that the DOM of pages later to see uh, if if uh, that uh, particular content element has that unique identifier that you've in, it, it embedded into it. Cookies are another big one. Um, the uh, some co cookies of several websites do not tie themselves to SSL. So if you visit mail.google.com is, is one of them. If you visit the HTTPS version of, of Google um, and you log in through HTTPS and then you continue to use it through HTTPS, you you will have this uh, have a, a number of cookies. One of them is this GX cookie. This uh, cookie is can be fetched out. You can use that to access mail.google.com outside of SSL. Now, this also means that you can do uh, you can insert a content element into C uh, uh, when a, a user on the local network or through the Tor network visits like CNN.com, and you can. Cause the browser to transmit that 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 cookie, uh, grab it, and then fetch their inbox behind their back, or send mails them, or whatever. And a lot of uh, several websites have this this order property. I was just well, I just ordered uh, some stuff uh, a bit ago, and the 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 shopping cart had the same problem, where uh, I was through SSL, but if you looked at if you you know looked used the Firefox extension uh, cookie color or whatever to inspect the cookies, the properties of the cookies, their cookies were any type of session. You know they they could be sent. Uh, outside of an SSL connection, so you know if somebody it, it, it's possible that in those cases somebody can go back and review my order and you know try and grab my credit card information or whatever. So those those sorts of things are are a, a danger both for Tor and 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 non-Tor usage. Uh, history disclosure is another big one. JavaScript can inf can uh, examine the DOM attributes of links and determine. Um, if they if they have the visited attribute or not, um, it can do this with a very high rate of speed, 10,000 queries a, sen a second. See if you have been to issued particular Google queries. See if you have, have visited certain websites. The Great Firewall, the Great Firewall can do this uh, against Tor users to see if they've Googled for for censored uh, Google queries. Um, you can even do this without JavaScript. You can do it with CSS and set a uh, the attribute the style for the visited to fetch an image. And, and without any JavaScript at all, examine people's history and see if they've queried it for uh, certain URLs. Um, and then general anonymity set reduction essentially uh, comes about because of uh, user agent, uh, location, uh, locale information, and um, uh, other other you know information like if you're the only Ice Weasel Debian user, uh, there's probably well there's probably not very many of them that definitely cuts down your your uh, anonymity set uh, considerably, and history records for that search and seizure case that I uh, discussed before. So the plugin wall of shame. All these plugins uh, can bypass proxy settings in one way or another. Flash is is pretty great because you'll look at it, and you w look at it in Wireshark. You'll say, "Oh, hey, it did fetch this thing through through my proxy. That's great." And you'll use it for a while, and then all of a sudden, it'll start making some connections outside your proxy, um, and you know, then it, it just disobeys uh, them for some reason. So. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know the details of ActionScript. That maybe you you can just say whether you want to listen to the proxy settings from the browser or not, or maybe it has to do with how the how the uh, embedded object is referenced in the page, um, or if the that that flash uh, thing is first the movie that then fetches other content itself through ActionScript. Um, those are possibilities. QuickTime has a has a proxy for a real time streaming protocol, which is primarily a UDP media protocol. Um, so that's really irrelevant, and d d that proxy setting doesn't apply to web streams and no other settings. Windows Media Player is the, probably the most amusing one. It does have proxy settings, even has a no bypass option. Uh, it still ignores it. So you can set that you know, in that application, and it'll still use both proxy and not proxy um, if you watch it in Ethereal. Um, Adobe Acrobat Reader uh, will leak DNS. M Player Plugin obeys proxy settings for uh, AVI files and stuff that you fetch just via straight HTTP, but it does support this real-time streaming protocol, which is UDP and some other things that it's unclear what the how those proxy settings uh, uh, really apply. Uh, so what's the solution to this? Uh, uh, I did, as I said, I did some work on improving Tor Button, uh, which is a Firefox extension for Tor, so you can toggle your Tor usage. Um, essentially, uh, I, de I disable all, all plugins while Tor is enabled. Um, 
uh, I, I isolated the dynamic content of a page in a couple of number of ways. Uh, CSS can, can fetch uh, elements based on your, your hover or whatever to do CSS-based prop-ups without any JavaScript involved. So I wrote an NSI content policy that uh, basically um, I tag every tab with the tour state of the load for that tab. And if, the, if a, a, a successive document fetch tries to happen through, you know, through that tab and it's, it, it, the original uh, the load state of that tab is different than the current tour state, that fetch is blocked. Also, similarly, I disable JavaScript uh, based on the, the, the tour state of the initial load. And as soon as you toggle tour, uh, I flip, uh, I disable JavaScript in all the, the tabs with a state during, different than the current one and re-enable it uh, in all the states, all the tabs with a state that is the same as the current one. Uh, cookie jars, your co uh, I have a, an option via code contributed by Colin Jackson that uh, saves all your cookies to a cookie jar uh, that can't be accessed through Tor. Uh, usage and is restored when you turn off Tor. Uh, cache management, uh, make sure the cache never writes to disk. Make sure that, it, uh, that, that it's wiped when you to toggle Tor. History management, um, this is um, essentially uh, the two, two, uh, a, another uh, interface that was implemented by Colin Jackson in, in one of his extensions um, to uh, prevent at the, at the rendering engine level uh, to, not in, uh, not, uh, to inform it whether a link is visited or not. So it blocks both the CSS and the JavaScript um, methods of um, of uh, determining whether you're not or not you have visited a site, and user agent spoofing during tour um, is uh, done a little bit better than the other extensions for for that. Uh, user agent spoofer um, is a Firefox extension that that tries to do this, but it misses a couple of JavaScript uh, ways of determining the user agent through the navigator object. You actually have to act, uh, Firefox itself has user agent settings that it doesn't apply to certain elements of this navigator object that you have to hook the methods of in order to return appropriate uh, versions for for those uh, for, you know for the when those methods are and, and attributes are examined um, time zone and locale spoofing uh, another thing this is this is a bit tricky Turn, the date turns out there's no way to specify your your time zone in in in, in Firefox you actually have to actively hook the uh, date object and make it return UTC times. Uh, the the uh, an example snippet of code for that is on is on the conference CD. If you're a JavaScript guru, uh, please have a look at that. I did try and vet it pretty much every every way I could think of to try and examine uh, ways to access the original wrapped uh, date object that I wrapped via lexical scoping um, to try and determine what the original time zone was and various ways of, of uh, copying objects and so on. But it it, it uh, and as far as I can tell, the method that I use to wrap that, JavaScript, that object, according to every ra JavaScript reference I read, is a valid method of, of, of obfuscating private member variables from, or uh, it, pr protecting private member variables from uh, external access. But uh, it's possible it, it may, uh, it, you know, I may have missed something. Um, so please, yeah, please, please do have a look at that. The ideal solution is for Firefox to provide a time zone setting that, that you know, we can guarantee applies. Um, so a demo of, of these sorts of things with, with Tor Button is probably in order. Um, so I have a few websites loaded over here um, with, with in basic information on this, this particular page has user agent information. I don't know if you can see this font. Uh, I can make that a little bit bigger. After a while, their, their, their CSS starts to fail. Uh, but... Um, Uh, here you can see uh, various, various user, uh, properties of that nav navigator object um, are, are queried. They're, then they report that I'm using Linux, a particular build of Firefox, and uh, operating system and CPU. So if I then uh, turn on Tor and fetch this via um, a, uh, a, 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 a you know, Tor fetch, you can see uh, when, as soon as that loads, we'll see that it, it has been reset. 
Uh, some of the, the other example I have is a, the CSS exploit, able to verify that I've been to Google and Slashdot. Um, time zone information, here's the, the, Pacific, the fact that I'm on Pacific time. Uh, plugin information, a list of my plugins. Here's a CSS only um, jo uh, history disclosure, no JavaScript involved. They're able to tell that I visited Google. So I probably should have loaded all of these. So I run, if I run through all of these, do, do, do. Well, I guess I'll just do that one. So here you see that uh, the user agent has been reset to Windows. All these properties are Win32. Um, so the user agent is pretty much taken care of. Uh, all the CSS ex exploit stuff fails, uh, or, or uh, the, the JavaScript method of, of, of detecting history uh, fails um, to tell that I've been to Google or uh, Slashdot. My history has not been cleared. Um, it, it, again, it's through the rendering engine. Um, time and date information. Oh, this one, did I reload the tour? Uh, Plug-in information. Um, no plugins have been loaded. CSS history uh, haven't, isn't able to tell that I have been through uh, Google. This one. Oh. CSS pop-ups. This, this uh, I, sh I should redo this one. Oh. Oh, slowly, slowly, slowly. And then there, the, the time zones are all reset to uh, a GMT on this one. Um, so the, the, the CSS pop-up will behave a little bit differently. I have to reload this. Uh, here you can see that uh, this thing fetches images for all, whenever, whenever it mounts over these, these uh, elements based, based on the a hover CSS attribute. Uh, if I reload this again and don't hover over, over those, and then turn on Tor and then hover over them, uh, they don't fetch. So via the content policy. Uh, interesting technical details. Is the job, I think the, probably the, the most interesting one of, the, one of these is the JavaScript hooking. Um, it's have a, if, if you are a JavaScript guru, again, have a look at that the, hand, the black hat handout on the uh, conference CD and have a look at that JavaScript. Uh, to my knowledge, it is solid, but it, it, uh, the, 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 I tried about a, de a dozen ways of, of attacking it, accessing the scope variable, um, trying to mo access the JavaScript source code via two, modifying the two string and, and such things, um, and copying various state objects, and all those seem to uh, seem to uh, f uh, fail. So all the, uh, those different attacks. Uh, so final thoughts, I guess. Um, oh, we're wrapping up uh, well, quite a bit early. Um, final thoughts, Tor security is uh, not equal to internet security. It's a, it's a superset. Uh, adversary has uh, different goals. Um, a lot of apps don't consider privacy vulnerabilities the same as, as regular vulnerabilities. They are, uh, you know, it's a, it, again, it's a different sort of threat model involved. So credits and contributions, the following people have uh, contributed. We've got Scott Squires, the original Tor Botan author. Colin Jackson uh, did the history hooking and, and cookie jars, borrowed his code. Johannes Renner is the Google Summer of Code. Uh, uh, student working on Tor flow and pa intelligent path selection, Nick and Roger for advice and Tor in general, um, and then shout out to my coworkers, I guess, for uh, well, at least one of them signs the expense reports, and the other two are are uh, are pretty good guys in general. Um, so, what can you do if you're interested in helping Tor on the conference CD? Is a Linux script for uh, doing load balancing uh, to prioritize Tor traffic below all your other node traffic. Um, it, uh, I use this on my own Tor node. It has, there doesn't, uh, I notice no impact from the Tor traffic over my SSH traffic or other web traffic. Uh, you basically, it's, uh, use the, the Linux QoS support, um, so it's, it's pretty handy. Um, a nice way to run a Tor node without really interfering with your other activity on your shell server or your whatever, whatever hosting you might be using. Um, 
And then again, please try and raise awareness. Uh, post some, uh, you know, plugins or patches to your to your apps to protect against information disclosure. You know, working work to raise awareness about privacy issues. Uh, Consider it part. It should be considered part of security measures. I think there's a lot of arguments for some of these issues with proxy settings that can be made independent of Tor. Um, similar th things. That's probably the best way to convince somebody that that a an issue with uh, 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 Tor is a good is is a good thing to fix is to find the example that uh, outside of Tor where it's still it's still a problem. So that pretty much that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, questions, comments. On, on those sorts of those protection mechanisms. Yeah. Okay. That is still uh, it's pre-proposal form. So there's a proposal system in Tor where people write up uh, proposals to. Uh, essentially, work on uh, you know proposed features. There's a lot of subtleties there and anonymity issues with providing that. There's also issues where you know um, uh, dissidents in China that are, are trying to bypass their their firewall aren't able to um, you know do this sort of thing. So that, do that mean do they get no service or are they going to be you know is it going to be horribly abysmal uh, service? So Other gen general questions? All right. Um, uh, yeah, I guess that I guess we wrapped up quite a bit early. Um,